It's very uh, exciting to see a major installation of your work here in London. And it reminded me that the first time I saw your work was rather a long time ago, in 1997 in Munster. And the experience was a kind of all-encompassing. It was a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk because, first of all, you had to find this location. And the space in which the work was presented was a tower. And you had to walk through, I think it was parkland or something, but to get to this uh, work, you had to make a journey. It was very important. There was a sort of epic quality to that. And then when you entered the tower, you, were, you entered a space which was saturated with color. And that color was dynamic. It was kinetic. And it came at a rush because the image behind the color was a, a flock of horses. It was absolutely breathtaking. And you felt the simultaneous sense of beauty and danger as these things pounded towards you. In a way, you were at the edge of, shall we say, the sublime. So I wanted to start there because it has all these different components which we've seen then in different iterations and developed in different directions through your work. Um, perhaps the first question is your consistent return to animals. Could you say something more about that? Sure. Um, I've worked throughout my career as an artist with uh, images of flora and fauna, so images from the natural world, including gardens and uh, national parks and forests, the rainforest as well, the canopy in the rainforest, and with all kinds of animals, with wolves, with dolphins, gorillas, um, uh, insects, uh, uh, honeybees, and uh, monarch butterflies, and now with monkeys. I was very interested from the beginning in working with animals and with uh, the natural world because it is by definition non-narrative. And I wanted to work with the representational but the abstract simultaneously. And because the lives of animals and the world of animals is non-narrative, and the world of nature is non-narrative. It exists in different kinds of time than the time we attribute to film and video and to moving images, to time-based media. I was very attracted to that. And I wanted to make work in film and video which was abstract and, um, as I said, representational. I didn't want to make bands of color and dancing squares and things like that. I wanted to make uh, images that you would recognize, of beings you would recognize in the world, and subjects to complement your subject. So uh, in order to work simultaneously with a time-based medium and with abstraction, I decided to work with the time and the space of nature. Mm. Now, we may think that this is the word nature um, itself is very complex and fraught because it can be unnatural. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's, a, there's a, a lot of exchange between nature and culture. For example, you often use animals or indeed show us animals with trainers. So there was an amazing work you made with wolves, mm -hmm. for example. So it's, it's very different from, say, David Attenborough, you know, doing a, a hiding in a box in, in a jungle or something. <laughs> It, it does take them into a different space. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, I'm, my work is really about the relationship between culture and nature, because of course nature is the other, and I think I always quote Claude Levi-Strauss said, the greatest tragedy um, of humankind is that we share the earth with beings with whom we cannot communicate. Mm -hmm. And I um, have always thought about that quote and about how we do ultimately communicate with animals and with the natural world and what forms of communication we use. So in my early work, I worked with trained animals. As Ivana said, I worked with wolves um, who had trainers. I, uh, and I, but these were wolves. They're wolves who performed in films in Hollywood. And they were trained to behave wild on command. Mm -hmm. So they were trained to bare their teeth or to, or to growl or to uh, act as if they were preying on something on command. And I was really interested in how 
one could command a wild animal to act wild. And, but uh, by 1999, I stopped working with trained animals because my work had led me to the point where I no longer uh, believed that animals, wild animals should be captive. And so after that, I made a very difficult decision, which was only to work with free animals. And after that, um, I only work now with wild animals or with rescued animals. So I've worked in Central Africa with rescued gorillas, gorillas who were rescued from the bushmeat trade. And um, I'm interested in all of the complex relationships that humans have constructed with animals and with, with the natural world, whether it's um, um, f how, we, how we frame them and how we behave around them and toward them and with them and how we uh, uh, see ourselves mirrored mm. in them mm. in some way. J just to go back to the wolves, I, I, I remember you, you saying that the relationship between men and women and wolves was also different. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that, okay, they're in the position of having to be captive and trained, but nonetheless, there were intimations of a kind of empathy mm -hmm. or different behavior around, just in the way that our pets behave differently with different mm -hmm. social groupings. And that seems to me to reveal a, a deep interspecies link, mm -hmm. actually, rather than otherness. Yes, and, and the, the most important thing about the wolves, and the reason I made work with wolves, is because wolf society, wolf culture, if you will, is so much structured in the same way that we structure our society. Mm. They live in family groups. They mate for life. Um, um, uh, they hunt together. They work together. They live together. Um, they take care of each other's babies, each other's cubs. And I was very interested in how wolves became dogs and the reason wolves became dogs. And the reason they did, of course, is because they lived so much like us. They're also so close to our size. The female wolf, China, who I worked with, is exactly my height and my weight when I worked with her. So um, there's so much in their culture that is like ours, and I was interested in how those two things blend, how wolves made themselves self-domesticated, which it's since been proven they did, in fact, do. We didn't domesticate them. They came to us and self-domesticated. So I was interested in why and how they did that. And it was really because their social structure and our social structure are so similar that they found a place that they could, where they could fit into our social structure and we accepted them because they live in much the same way we do, hunt the same size prey, for example. So that's, yeah, that's really true. Well, what also I think is interesting about your work is that it, it incorporates within it the old mythological cultural memories, if you like, that we have, because in particular wolves, monkeys, they've all had a very powerful uh, role within fables, within narrative. Um, and the wolf particularly has been sort of vilified over the, oh, over yeah. the centuries, mm -hmm. but it's also been associated with sexuality, mm -hmm. Little Red Riding Hood and so on. And, and I think that your work not only evokes that, but it's not, it doesn't stay within it. It somehow brings it into the idea of a new relationship. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask, we, there's been a, a kind of new term spoken of in terms of geological epochs, the Anthropocene as this era where human settlements have now or are in danger of destabilizing. Mm -hmm the global ecosystem. Is there a sort of politics in your work as well? Yeah, I mean, I just, it's interesting you bring that up, of course, because I'm just working on my retrospective catalog. I was just writing about the Anthropocene in my catalog. And there are some quotes from Mackenzie Wark, for example, who's written a lot about it in the book. Uh, I'm very, very interested in the relationship between humans and nature and in, you know, ultimately, and a lot of people find a lot of pathos in the work, as well as empathy, um, and that is because the work does have this element of tragedy in it, which is the destruction of the natural world and the destruction of natural um, behaviors among animals. And a lot of the animals I work with are tragic figures. For example, the gorillas, I said, were rescued from the bushmeat trade as tiny babies 
because their parents and their family group were entirely wiped out by poachers. So there is always this element of the sort of tragedy of the Anthropocene mm -hmm. in the work mm -hmm. and um, in the destruction mm -hmm. of nature. And um, yeah, the wolf has been or was eradicated in the United States and is just being brought back. But of course, people are still anxious mm -hmm. to kill them. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's sort of atavistic fears as well. It's kind mm -hmm. of interesting that you've also worked with tigers and so on. The other quality about the work that keeps returning is this very, very intense use of colour, for example, mm -hmm. your, your um, different uses of sound. So I, I wondered if we might talk a little bit about the formal aspects of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you live and work in Hollywood, of course, yes. um, and so uh, you've also spoken about the influence of structuralism on your work. I wonder if you could say something about your use of colour, uh, thinking about the gorilla, gorilla, gorilla work, for example, there's this very intense use of green, uh, the, the, the film with the horses, I mean, that seems to be another component within the work. Yeah, I think it, because the work is installation. And for me, installation, the definition of installation is an artwork you know, that exists halfway between sculpture and architecture. Um, and because uh, uh, the work is installation, I want you as a body, as a subject, as a being, to always be, once you walk in, you're inside of the work. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to do that, and one of the ways I found, to, I, I have found, to make people incredibly conscious of space. Now, you're not conscious of space all the time. You're only conscious of space when I tell you you're conscious of space, right? Or when you think about spatiality, or you're in a very special space, like a Baroque church or something like that. But in this room, you're not necessarily, if this room didn't have that doorway, didn't have this projection, didn't have that big blue frame around it, you wouldn't necessarily be conscious of the space. So it's just like when you dive into water, you're conscious of water, but fish aren't conscious of water, I think, as because it's their space, right? It's their medium. And I want you always to be conscious of the space you're in once you enter into the work of art. And so one of the ways I found to do that is to use very intense color to fill a space with very intense colors like magenta, like green, like red, like cyan to fill a space with very intense color. And when you walk into it, I want the color to sort of fizzle. And I want you to feel, I want you to feel space. And that's really something I've worked very hard in, in, in doing in trying to make you feel space. And a lot of the time I use color in the work and I'll use complementary colors in the spaces uh, in which the work is projected. So the color is part of the work. Mm -hmm. This is you know, this particular work <coughs> uses very little color. Actually, it's mostly natural natural mm -hmm. color. But yes, I mean, most of my work uses mm -hmm. very intense tones. Mm -hmm. And sound is another component which may or may not be present. You've worked often in collaboration with the artist T. Kelly Mason. Mm -hmm. um, could you say something about that component in the work? When I work. On my own, when I work in in installation um, like this one in particular, or like most of my large installations or even small installations, I work with silence and just the sound of the equipment, the sound of people walking around. I want you again to be pre conscious of your presence, of your footsteps, the voices of other people, of uh, the quiet. And I want you to be conscious of that because I want you to remain in the present. And sound is used, and when you look at film or you look at a lot of installation work that utilizes sound, it's used to transport you into another kind of space. And I don't want to transport you. I want you to be present in the here and now. When I do work with sound, I work with an artist who, do, who makes sound installation. And we've made three big projects together. And they're all, they all utilize music and installation. And that has a whole sort of different turn mm -hmm. to it. And is that music specially composed? No, we've used, <clears throat> what we've done is we've used, um, we did a piece with Bob Dylan's Subterranean Homesick Blues with uh, children jumping rope, another kind of animal, if you will. Um, and we did a piece with uh, the Buzzcocks. Uh, 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 now I'm going to, sorry. Excuse me for not remembering the title. Um, 
Uh, we did a, a but with the really classic, like famous, iconic songs. And we have, a, and Kelly is in a band, and the band plays the songs uh, in a variety of ways. Mm. And I choreograph and film it, and then we project it, and we create a kind of sculptural installation around it. One was called Jump, and the other was called. Um, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm very tired. I've been doing a lot. So, but that is. But when I work with sound, I work with. I am. I'm. I work with someone who specializes in that, and in special, and someone who specializes in sculpting space with sound. I sculpt space with images. He sculpts space with sound. And when we work together, we each. Um, uh, do our specialty, essentially. Yeah. So that brings in another term in the work, which is architecture. Um, and it seems to me that, again, there's this tension between what, what you find, what you occupy, and we'll go on to talk about what's happening here in this space, mm -hmm. uh, but also the, the artifice, the stage set, the sound studio, that there mm -hmm. are these two different systems coming into play. Yeah, I'm very, very interested in... Um, architectural space and sometimes I'm very lucky because people invite me to work with complicated spaces difficult spaces so I worked with Peter Packish and Graz with that crazy mm. Peter Cook building um, so I work with very or in Munster for example it was an 11th century stone tower with uh, nearly spiral stairs that went from the ground to like four or five stories up and had very low ceilings. It was very dank and dark. Um, so I get to work with very special spaces. And I'm really, really interested because I studied uh, architectural history before I became an artist. I studied uh, art history, but my specialization was architecture. So I've always been interested in, in the built environment. And the built environment is, again, something very particular. You know, it's, 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 a, it's such an expression, such a strong expression of culture and of who we are and at what moment we live and at what moment that building was built. And I always try to make my work relate in some way to the architecture. If there isn't any real architecture, as there is in this space, I give it. Mm -hmm. something. And this is the first time I've ever sculpted something architecturally to go with my work. Normally I try to use spaces in the way that I find them. I try not to build in mm -hmm. them. So, and I've been lucky in that sense because I've gotten interesting spaces. But when I haven't gotten really interesting spaces, when I get boxes, I uh, uh, try to do something architectural with the work mm -hmm. itself and have the work integrate or uh, conflict with the architecture. Again, it's another way of making you feel, uh, or of, 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 of asking the viewer to feel uh, as if they are in the present and to be aware of space. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is to break up architecture with broken images or images that go around corners and doorways and windows. It's also something people don't do with film and video, which is to project over a doorway or pro right there, or mm -hmm. to project over a window, for example. And it's a way of making you aware of the window. It's a way of using the space sculpturally, but it's also um, a way of creating an architecture within an architecture, mm -hmm. an architecture of images. And in this work, you see you're in a theater. You're actually in a movie theater. Um, and the monkeys are projected on the screen. So you're in an architectural space, even if it's just the most basic, simple space, like mm. a theater. So would you say there's a kind of phenomenological <laughs> dimension to it about how, because they are quite disorientating as well. Mm -hmm. You know, where you've seen things in corners or above you or tilted and so on. Mm -hmm. Let's go and talk now about this work. So um, the origin of it is a temple in India. Mm -hmm. What drew you to this, and what was the story of the making of it? Well, I'm always, you know, I spend my time reading science magazines, and uh, I read a lot of history, and I, of course, I spend all my time watching, you know, most of my free time watching, you know, David Attenborough documentaries <laughs> about nature, which is like my, my hobby. It's my favorite. I want to hide in a box and film tigers with David Attenborough, but um, I don't have the courage. But... I, um, what do I want to say? Oh, maybe ask the question. Sorry, I was just, um, 
asking how, how I you came to, this, yeah. to a temple in India. Yeah, I like to come across, come across things in my reading all the time, and I think that's, you know, that's for me. That's what I want next. Mm. And some things I save, and I always talk about I keep them in the back of my head, and when it's time, I move it to the front of my head, and I start really thinking about making that particular work. So I keep some things in the back of my head for years and years. And this was something I had in the back of my head. I had read about a temple in Burma uh, where Buddhist monks take care of orphan tigers. And the tigers, and there were these great photographs that I found online, I think, of the monks meditating with tigers laying around them. And I thought, this is just fantastic. I have to film this. And um, I didn't end up going there for various reasons. It's complicated. But I decided to find, and I was aware that there were other temples, and I was talking to a friend of mine. I was going to go to a snake temple where they have snakes. I was talking to a friend of mine, and I said, I, I, I want to go to I'm monkeys, monkeys, monkeys. And he said, I've just been to this temple in Jaipur, and there are wild monkeys everywhere. So I went and I researched it, and it turned out, of course, that it's a temple to Hanuman, the monkey god, the Hindu monkey god, who's part man, part monkey very, um, he's a hero, he's a heroic figure in Hindu mythology. And this gets back to what you said before about the mythological. And um, I decided I was going to go there. And I saw what really, you know, it wasn't just the fact that it's a temple to the monkey god, Hanuman, that is inhabited by wild monkeys. I mean, wild monkeys come out of the hills and came to live there. Uh, but it was also the facade in the other room, which is this magnificent facade of the temple that interested me. If the, t if the temple didn't look the way it looked, I would not have been interested in it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I decided to go there and then started to make my, my plans and then ended up there exactly a year ago filming. And the temple is actually... A facade. Is it's that right? ju it's just a facade. It's a <laughs> fake. It's a fake, and that, of course, is fascinating yeah. to me. An architect. So this temple is not a temple that you can go into. It has a doorway, and you think you might be able to go in. But what it really is is just a facade of a temple built right up against a cliff. So if you could go in it, you'd just be looking at a cliff at the at rock. So it's just a facade built against a cliff, so there is no inside. And that is completely interesting to me, that somebody would go to all that trouble to build simply a facade uh, which can't be penetrated. And there's this magnificent doorway, which is cut out here, and there's a pool in front of it. So there's a doorway, and you think maybe you can go in, but there's water in front of it, which is deep, so you can't actually go in. But somebody bothered to cut a doorway into a fake temple, and, and then it's inhabited by monkeys, and the whole thing is dedicated to Hanuman. How could I not go? You know what I mean? It was just, it was just made for me yeah. in some way. It wasn't made for me, but this guy I love, he's very, very thoughtful. But the quality of it is also, you know, it's a Potemkin, it's, um, it, it's reminiscent of stories like Alice in Wonderland, because it's su it has such a lure, and yet, you know, it can't ever quite be what it, what it is, uh, 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 sorry, appears to be. And um, you've now taken this architectural detail, this scallops arch, and brought it here to London. Mm -hmm. why, why did you do that? I wanted the, my, you know, every time I go to make a piece, I have some vision of what I'm going to film. And I thought that the temple had an inside, and I thought that the monkeys would be inside, and I could film the monkeys inside this Hindu temple. Then I found out it was just a facade. And, but in my work, I always work with this idea of the inside and the outside. Um, and when you're inside a work of art, uh, uh, do you look at the outside? Do you look at the, what does it mean to be inside or outside of something? What does it mean to be inside of space or outside of space or inside of time and outside of time? So I wanted to give the temple the one thing it does not have, which is an interior. Mm -hmm. And so I brought the doorway home with me. And I gave my temple, my monkey temple, its own interior. But instead of giving it a kind of interior which I would just make up, I gave it the interior that I know, which is the interior of a theater. 
-hmm. And so when you walk in here, you see that these are theater seats and there's a person sitting there watching a film of the monkeys. Mm -hmm. And so there's this series of flatnesses. So you have this flat facade, which has no interior. You come through, you have this flat image, which uh, tells you you're in a kind of theatrical space, and then you have the screen of the monkey. So I wanted to work with three spaces, three layers. Um, it's interesting in Britain because, you know, the empire and all that, mm -hmm. um, that actually Orientalism uh, was translated into theatre spaces. And so yes. it's a kind of brilliant uh, kind of historical echo of that. Yes, and it is in LA as well because we have the big old movie palaces. Mm -hmm. And each of these great movie palaces in LA, uh, there's one that's French Rococo. Mm -hmm. And of course, Mann's Chinese Theater, which is very famous, mm -hmm. which used to be Grauman's Chinese Theater, is Chinese. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have all of those fantasy spaces mm -hmm. in LA, but you know, we just take them from everywhere because we have no history, right? So we just like <laughs> grab them as we like, yeah. you know? There's um, a, a section, I think it's in Passage to India, where a, a little excursion of very stiff, prim, colonial expats in, has this very disturbing encounter. They, they, they stumble across a temple in the jungle and it's highly sexualized. There are these very erotic sculptures. And suddenly, these monkeys make an appearance. And it's almost like a, a metaphor for this re repressed sexuality and this incredible anxiety about the erotics mm -hmm. of the exotic. You know, that they were there to the white man's burden and all that. Uh, what made you choose monkeys? Because they do have this association with mischief uh, with sexuality, with, with um, they're, they're playful, but they're also slightly menacing. Yeah, I, I was reading um, Donna Haraway oh. and um, Cyborg Simeons and Women. Is that mm. the right title? Yeah. Cyborg mm. Simeons and Women. And um, there's a great section. I mean, these are rhesus macaque monkeys. And one of the reasons I wanted to work with these monkeys specifically is because these are the experiment monkeys. Yeah. These are the monkeys who, on whom most scientific experiments are done, rhesus monkeys. And you, I'm sure you all know that you've heard the term rhesus monkey. And um, you know they're injected with AIDS, their parts of their brains are cut out. They're very similar to us, but they are tortured. And Donna Haraway wrote about the, the worst, uh, most sort of villainous scientist, whose name was Harry Harlow, who did this famous experiment called the cloth, weather, cloth mother wire mother. And he, all, he separated infants from their mothers um, and gave them the option of either going to a, a mother made of wire who had a bo baby bottle, who had food, or a mother made of cloth who had no food. So the question was, would the infants go to food or to comfort? And they all chose comfort. And he called this really horrific experiment on the nature of love, which is sick. I mean, that's just literally sick. But I, I was very interested in our complicated relationship with these animals. But I was also interested in the character, the way we characterize monkeys, mischievous, cheeky, naughty. Um, and at the same time, menacing, people call them a nuisance, and they steal, and they attack people, and they'll bare their teeth at you. Um, so I was interested in our relationship to them, but also the way we see them as sort of comical figures. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why they're in super close-up here. So I'm very interested in, in um, their expression, in their eyes, in their mouths, in their facial expressions, in their character. And that's, of course, also why it's a movie screen, because that's where we see the close-up mm. of the movie mm. star, mm -hmm. is on the movie screen. And so that's why you're in a theater, and they're on the screen. They're, I'm very fascinated by their facial expression and, and the, the sort of cheekiness of them and the naughtiness of them. And um, I don't know, there's just, just this, this is why I wanted to And we've them. got this anthropomorphic kind of empathy, I think, or this sense of recognition. Exactly. Um, can I ask you about the title, Life as a Time-Based Medium? Mm -hmm. 
So duration is a very important aspect of your work. Very different uh, concepts, but also different experiences of time. You've, you've immersed us in different experiences of time. Mm -hmm. um, tell us about the connection with, with life. I mean, it's kind of obvious that <laughs> we have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, but mm -hmm. you've called it a medium. Yeah, I called it a medium. I was uh, a good friend of mine is a philosopher and a theorist, and I was writing to him about time-based media because you know that's the phrase we use for film and video that they are time-based in in the art world. We call them time-based media because they have the one thing that painting doesn't have, that sculpture doesn't have. They exist. Uh, they portray time. They are images of time. Um, and I was writing to my friend about time-based media, and he wrote back, Diana, your life is a time-based medium. And I said, that's good. I want that <laughs> for a title, you know, because animals, because there are so many kinds of time, and animals don't live in our time. Mm. They, they have other concepts of time that I don't even think we can imagine. We can't imagine their concept of time what the present, the past, and the future might mean to them. And I said before that animals in nature don't exist in narrative time the way we do. They don't have beginnings, middle. They don't see, or they, I don't think that they could see their lives in terms of a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm. That there are different kinds of life cycles. Nature is, is either circular or it's spiraling, or uh, it exists entirely in the present. And that's kind of... Um, so I don't know why I titled it that. <laughs> Life is a time-based medium. It's a projection. It's, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I just, it spoke to me, and I named the piece that. I'm not, I don't know. I just made it. So sometimes I feel like I don't quite know why I did what I did. On a, just a final, very practical question. How do you deal with the longevity of your work when mm. technology just keeps moving on and on. I mean, you know, does anyone remember pneumatic tape or videotape? I sure do, of uh, course. It's long gone. And then there were, you know, those discs and Blu-ray discs mm -hmm. and DVDs, and now it's all digital. What happens to those older works? How do you keep them? The, yeah, the works are all... Um, I, uh, when you work with technology, you always anticipate the death of that technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of my work from the very beginning, uh, m m when you make work like this, it's not like a painting or a sculpture. It only exists when you put it up. And so each piece comes with a book, a little booklet that tells you how to put it up. But it also tells you about the future of the work, um, what kind of projector it's shown on now. But in the future, there will always be a kind of projection machine. So you can update this work to that projection machine, but that machine must be in the room. It must sit on whatever case it comes inside of. Uh, it's always going to need electricity. It's always going to need to be plugged in. So those wires have to always be exposed. Um, it's always going to need certain things. And projection machines are going to always exist. The problem, of course, is film itself. And I've made some work in 16 millimeter and Super 8 film, and those are the, that's the real problem. And those works come with the equipment. Mm. So the 16 millimeter film piece that I made, um, which is called Between Science and Magic, comes with 16 millimeter film projectors. Mm. And when those, and those can keep being repaired because they're very simple machines. Mm. You can keep repairing them, and they've been repairing them for years and keeping them up to date. But when they go, the piece will go. Mm. There are only a few pieces of mine like that. But so. would you then transfer them? No, is it there can't a digital be. copy of any of that? That can't be. That piece can't ever be transferred because it's all about film. Yeah. You know, it's all about the medium itself mm -hmm. and being in the room with that movie projector, making all of that noise mm -hmm. in the space. Well, one thing that one comforting piece of news is that ZKM in Karlsruhe, mm -hmm. a museum dedicated to multimedia work, time-based work, is keeping all the defunct equipment of 
the 20th century. Mm -hmm. It's stockpiling bulbs, projector bulbs, Brilliant. slide carousels, Super 8, 16 mil. So at least there's a repository somewhere in the world where I can, where, where people who, <laughs> structuralists can go and right, and exactly. Like Old filmmakers can go, but it's <laughs> great because you know people like Tacita Dean are working really hard yes. to yeah. preserve film and to make a case for preserving film. I think that's really important. And Quentin Tarantino in Hollywood just bought mm. this amazing theater, the New Beverly, which is a 35 millimeter movie theater. And you know, most of your movie theaters now are digital video projections. He bought it and he's very committed to keeping it a 35 millimeter mm. projection theater. Mm. So there are people, and Christopher Nolan as well, is very committed to preserving film and film equipment. But Kodak just stopped making 16 millimeter film. So it's very difficult to work with film. But I, Sometimes I shoot, in, I've shot in 35, 16, Super 8, Super 16, all, I've shot in everything you could possibly shoot. A lot of it I transfer because I just want, I'm just shooting for a particular reason. But if I shoot for it to be shown on film, then I'm going to have to go to ZKM yeah. at some yeah. point, or someone who comes along after me will have to go there and dig up that equipment. Yeah. So if we mere mortals ever wanted to, Get a die on a theatre work. Do you do you do other mediums? Do you use stills or photography or no? No, I'm very. I'm. I've made some some photographs of very particular moments mm -hmm. um, in my work. I've made some big photographs, but no. And it's very. It's a difficult commitment as an artist to make. It's very hard to make a living. Um, as an artist, because it's very hard to buy this kind of work. And, um, but I'm so committed to the, to this medium itself, to time-based media, and to the kind of experience that it produces, that there's, I can't, it's very hard for me to think in still images. I always, I think in moving mm -hmm. images. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it's got to be. Of course, Ivan Worth, you know, was always like, Diana, make a painting, you know, but I haven't thought of what, when I think of a painting, I will make it, I promise him. So, may I ask any of you if you'd like to ask a question or, or comment about the work? Who among you has seen uh, other works of, of Diana? A couple of yeah, people. Well, what have you seen? <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. Well, some of my favourites include horses um, and uh, the works of the zebras and some of it, that approach to painting in a way. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, but um, I suppose one of the questions that I've been mulling over, um, I love what you said towards the beginning about um, uh, uh, subjectivity, uh, complementary subjectivity between mm -hmm. um, us and the monkeys. Um, I mean, let me thinking much more about um, the nature of your gaze, mm -hmm. your gaze, mm -hmm. Diana's gaze, mm -hmm. and what I've seen in, 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 in your work. And it's, it's extremely hard to pin down, actually. It's, it's sort of, the only word that I can think of is liquid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I mean, I... am very aware, I'm so aware of the gaze all the time, because so, it's so fraught, right? I mean, this idea is so fraught. Of course, we have the classic sort of Laura Mulvey text about the, the, the male gaze, and that, um, you know, image-making machines uh, mimic the male gaze. And for me, they've always, always, it's always been extremely problematic, so I'm very aware of the way I look and how I look. And, but mostly what I want to know by looking and um, I try, I try I work a lot with scientists, but I find I don't look the way they look. I don't see the way they see. But I'm very interested in how they see things. So my gorilla piece actually has a scientist in it, and it's silent, and it's a, an, a projection of him, and he's explaining gorillas, he's explaining gorillas. And behind him is a gorilla, and she's imitating him. It's this beautiful moment. And he's saying, well, gorillas in the wild, and she's going like this. And, and we're laughing, 
And he turns around and looks at her, and she just looks the other way. And he starts again, and she starts again, and we're laughing, and he turns and looks, and she just looks the other way, and it's this great moment. And how do you, it's all about looking, and it's all about who looks at whom, and who explains who to whom, you know? Who's explaining what, and how are they explaining it? And it's silent because you know what he's saying. He's obviously a scientist, he's wearing khaki, he's sitting in front of a gorilla, he's gesturing to her. You know exactly what he's saying, so you don't have to hear him. It's the gestures and it's the looking back and forth between the animal, the scientist, and the filmmaker, and the complexity of those kinds of gazes, you know? So I'm very, very aware of looking and how I look and treat it differently. Every animal, with, with whom I work and every uh, natural environment with which I work, um, I look at differently and I try to see in it some, what I could only call its being or its essence or I'm, I'm looking for their you know, affective relationship to the world. And you need to look differently because every being is different. So you need to look differently at every being. And I try to be really conscious of that. Mm -hmm. Did you see um, the film of Pierre Huyg with the uh, monkey in yeah, the restaurant? Yeah, it was just in LA. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's very disturbing. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's tragic. It, it's tragic on so many levels, I, and it's a rhesus macaque as well. It's the same mm. species. Mm. And um, well, this is actually this little bit right here. If I can mention another artist, is a little homage to Mike Kelly, oh. because one of my favorite works of Mike Kelly's is called Monkey Island, and it's all about the red ass of the rhesus macaque monkey. And so I put in the monkey grooming the red bottom of this other monkey, because Mike was a very close friend of mine, a very important artist to me. So I put that little moment in just like, hi, Mike. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been thank a you. Great privilege to have thank you, you here. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs>